Hello, my name is Fiona Matthews and I'm Chair of the Mammal Society and what I'm going to talk to you about today is the mammals that are on the red list, why they're on there, uh, how we came to produce the red list and to give you some ideas for what needs to be done next. And along the way I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about new pieces of research that we're doing as well. And before I start, I'd just like to acknowledge the wonderful photographers who uh, so generously provide photographs. Now, you may well have seen in the media over the last year or so, um, statements about one in four species being threatened with extinction. And the first thing to say is, yes, these numbers actually are true. If we apply IUCN criteria, then that is the state of Britain's mammals. And there are infographics, if you head over to the Mammal Society website, there's infographics like this that you can download for um, Wales and Scotland and for Great Britain as a whole. Now, I'm going to start with a bit of a quiz. So I'm going to give you a second to think, what species is that? And the answer is it's a three-banded armadillo. Now, what has the three-banded armadillo got to do with these? which are, of course, Asian elephants. And even more perplexingly, what have they got to do with the grey long-eared bat? And the answer to that is all of them are considered to be regionally endangered. So on their regional red list for their countries, if we're looking at armadillo, uh, the three-banded armadillo in Brazil, or the Asian elephant in India, or the grey long-eared bat in Britain, they're all classed as endangered. So the great value really behind a red list is it provides something of a, of a level playing field across which we have this concept of the degree to which something is threatened and it means that you know it's hard to point the finger at India and ask them why they're not doing more for Asian elephants if we have species in the same sort of position and aren't taking rigorous action to try and restore them. Now, of course, those are regional red lists operating at country level. We also can take a view about what's going on in, in a global scale. So in the case of the Asian elephant, well, that's endangered globally too, not least because a high proportion of the population is actually found in India. The three-banded armadillo, on the other hand, at a global scale is doing a little bit better. It's classified as vulnerable. And our grey long-eared bat, at a global scale, is considered least concern. As I'll explain later, least concern doesn't mean we can forget about them and walk away, but what it does mean is there's not any prospect of them going extinct anytime soon globally. Now, I think it's important that we just spend a few minutes considering why we might want to conserve those species which are not on our uh, home, our domestic red list, because I get asked lots of questions about this. How come Beckstein's bats and Greater Horseshoe bat, for example, are not on the red list? And the reason is that they're not experiencing any of the so sorts of declines that they'd need to within Britain that would mean that they end up classified as red list. But of course, there still could be very good reasons for conserving them. 
So again, much like the grey long-eared bat at a global scale, the greater horseshoe, which is spread, you know, it has a massive global distribution and it's not about to go extinct in the very near future. However, the population is decreasing. If we look within Europe, what you can see here is that while within the southwest of England and Wales, it's actually doing really well and is in favourable conservation status. Across France and Spain and uh, going into Portugal, not only is it in unfavourable status, but it's considered that the habitat is inadequate. And in some countries, um, notably in Italy, the situation is considered unfavourable um, in population terms and that the habitat is not suitable. And in fact, this species has gone extinct in the recent past in Belgium and the Netherlands and Malta and there's a lot of concern in Germany and Switzerland because of the scale of declines going on there. So at a European scale this is considered near threatened. It's telling us that something needs to be done and also telling us that our position as being one of the few countries where it's doing rather well is something not only that we need to celebrate as a quite rare success story but also that it's really important that we don't take our eye off the ball and think okay right we don't do anything for them and let them slip back into the situation that they are elsewhere in Europe because a lot of um, the entire British population uh, the entire European population is actually found in Britain. Okay, so in terms of what the IUCN Red List actually, actually means or how you do it, there's 170 pages of guidance on how you actually um, draw up the, the threat status categories. I don't propose to go into that now, you'll be pleased to know, but I'll just give you the, the key pointers. And essentially what we come up with is this scale going from least concern Near threatened is it's not about to go extinct anytime soon, but there's a plausible risk that it might become in a threatened category in the near future. And then with increasing level of threat going from vulnerable to critically endangered, and then of course to the extinct categories. Now, in order to do a red list assessment, what you have to do is look at each species in the context of five different criteria that are very specifically uh, described. But essentially, these relate to, first of all, is the population declining? And that information could either come directly from counts, for example, um, or from inference about range or occupancy changing. distribution and note that it's not good enough, in inverted commas good enough, for the distribution just to be restricted but there also has to be a decline or a fluctuation in the population. Similarly a small population of itself is not sufficient because you could be small and stable, it's almost strong and stable, small and stable and also declining at the same time or have an extremely small or geographically restricted population. And those really are very small. Or to be classified at risk on the basis of some form of quantitative analysis. Basically, this means population viability modeling. And I have to say, there are very, very few species where that is done. Um, in the UK red list, the only species that we could draw on that for was actually the wildcat. Everything else, we just don't have the data to do it. So the, um, the red list draws upon information that's in the review of the population and conservation of British mammals. If you want to buy one, there you go, rather beautiful, you can get it from NHBS. It is thick, but you can download it if you want to. Um, and if you go to that website there on the Natural Room website, you can do that. And that list, actually, we're able to gather uh, on species range, long-term trends, short-term trends and population sizes, as well as also reviewing the scale of threats and our bit of slight crystal ball gazing to look at what's going to happen in the future. It of course wasn't entirely crystal ball gazing, we actually based the assessment on information such as that in um, who nevertheless I put some caveats on it 
because we don't know exactly how things like changes to our green environment subsidies are going to affect our wildlife going forward. Okay, so just to remind you then, we have these uh, different categories of how, how we might come to put something on the red list. Let's think for a moment about the data that we actually need in order to make those assessments. So basically this can be distilled down into is the range or the population size falling or is it plausible that it's going to do soon? Is it is its um, distribution very small or is it very fragmented? Is it very small? So the first place that we reach for this is to look at the and so the starting point for that is actually from the bookshops or from NHBS um, that the Mammal Society published just um, uh, and what that has, sorry not earlier this year, the end of last year, um, and what that shows is the distribution atlases for all of the all of Britain's mammals. And what we do is we take that information and we smooth it to produce an estimate of the um, likely range for the species. And the reason that we do this is, of course, you're always going to get outlying data points. Now, this is a data point that has been accepted by the Biological Record Centre or the, the local recorder, but nevertheless, it's separate from this cluster of points here. So in the smoothing map, what happens is bits that are spaced out, like here, for example, um, we're basically drawing smooth lines around them using a statistical process. Okay, so this is the um, the, the end map that comes up. And if you uh, use Mammal Mapper, um, our online recording app, that's an example of where you'll see these maps. Okay, um, in case you're wondering what species that was, that was a bit of a quiz, it's Barbastel. So that was the extent of occurrence or EOO. And you might wonder what genius thought that we'd have another acronym AOO. And that stands for the area occupied by the species. Now, in the case of IUCN and the red list process, we don't use the atlas squares, the 10 kilometer squares. What we use instead is two kilometer squares. So it's much finer spatial resolution. And what that means is that your individual records count because <clears throat> although you might think, oh, it's not worth recording this species because somebody else around here will have recorded it. Actually, once you get down at the two kilometre level, you'd be amazed um, how sparse the data become. So if we just look at these two values to do with range, the occupancy and the overall geographical range, the extent of occurrence. If we look at it in relation to Barbastel, these are the thresholds for inclusion on the red list. And you can see that in both cases, the Barbastel is well above those thresholds. So it's not qualifying on the red list under criterion B, okay? Whereas for the gray long-eared bat, you can see that this species is well below both of those criteria. So that's one of the reasons for putting the gray long-eared on the red list. But also we know that its population is severely fragmented. It has a loss of extent and quality of habitat, which is particularly because it's losing uh, things like wet meadows, and there's a fall in the number of subpopulations. Okay. So then the next question is, or the next sort of criteria that we're looking at is, is the population small, or at least how big is the population size? And this is another tricky exercise to do. So what the main approach that we've taken is said okay we'll look within the geographical range of the species we will work out how much habitat of each kind is available so we might look um, at the different sorts of woodland types that are available within the landscape we multiply those by density estimates that have been made in different sorts of woodland and from that we can make an inference about the total number of red squirrels um, it's obviously not a perfect system and with things like grey squirrels, one of the problems is getting good density estimates for 
the areas outside woodland because obviously we know that they can exist um, in parks and you know scattered trees along hedgerows and those sorts of things and we don't have a good handle on that so that might be something that locally you might be interested in collecting data on. In the case of bats things became a bit more tricky because there's not really a sense in which we could say well the density of bat in this woodland is however many per hectare because for a start, we don't know where all the roosts are. And secondly, the bats are moving. So it might be that, OK, they might have a lot of roosts in woodland, but they can also roost in buildings. So then are we going to make a density estimate in of how many buildings are occupied in a landscape? It's very difficult to do. And so we came up with a different system, which is to, to ask people about roost densities in 10 by 10 kilometres squared. And these of their best estimates of people in different parts of the country making estimates for each species. And for a very few species, so principally the greater and lesser horseshoe bats, we could also do direct counts. Okay. It wasn't possible to get that far, so the barbus bat is an example where we just didn't know anything about the density of, although it's a woodland specialist, had no idea what proportion of woodlands have this species in or not. So one of my PhD students, Kieran O'Malley, is just starting a new citizen science-based project to go and assess woodlands within a defined geographical area so that then we can say what proportion are occupied. And again, you know, there's lots of species um, where this would be a useful exercise, whether you're talking about natura's bats or lyslas or noctules, <coughs> knowing a lot more about that distribution would be helpful. Okay, so then in the case of bats, what we do is we multiply that by the size of roosts and that size is based on the literature and national bat monitoring programme data. And you can come up then with the central estimate. Um, and we also put around that lower plausible limits and upper plausible limits, which is based on asking people within your 10 kilometres square, what's the lowest number of um, roosts that you think you're likely to find? And conversely, for the upper limit, what's the maximum uh, number that you like to find? And then similarly, we'd apply those upper and lower limits to roost sizes as well. And so we're getting some handle on the degree of uncertainty. And one thing I just wanted to point out is just how much the uncertainty there is about quite a number of these estimates. And this is something I wanted to be really transparent about in leading this project, because I think too often in this press, you know, there's half a million hedgehogs or whatever. And there's a real question about where does that number come from? And in any case, what's the certainty around that? Um, so you can see for Dorbenton's bat, we go from a very low number to an extremely high number. Similarly for hedgehogs, we actually cannot put any confidence intervals around that estimate because we don't have the right sort of data. Um, I think we need to do better. We need more. We need more information. OK, so one thing that the Mammal Society is uh, doing at the moment and coming probably next week is a new system called Count Bat, in which we're encouraging people to deposit their bat records into our EcoBat system. Um, and just to say, any records you deposit with us will be made, or they are made freely available to local record centres as well. If you're a consultant, uh, it's possible to lock the records, so they're not made freely available, but they will be available in the background for future analyses of this sort of um, this kind. And in return for, for putting in your data, what you get back then is information on how your roost is comparing with others in the area. So this is an example where this might be observation, this is your count of bats in a dwelling house. So you can see compared with other um, surveys that have been done in dwelling houses, you're pretty close to the median, you're a little bit higher. Um, and you can also see things like there haven't been many studies of this species in bridges, okay, and the one that was done was an extremely high count, but it's there's only one survey available there, as opposed to in the dwelling house we've got, what's that, 489 in the data set. So I hope that you will consider using that. 
Okay, going back to these assessment criteria then, the, the final one is, has the population declined over three generations? And to get at that, either we can look at changes in the estimates of population size, so we can compare the recent review with the old one done by Steve Harris in 1995, we can also use indices um, based on things like the Dormouse Monitoring Program and the Monitoring Program. So most of them are going up in those indices. In the case of Dormice, it's going down. We can also, though, uh, look at other things. There's a lot of species, obviously, which don't have a formal monitoring program. So we can look at things like, is the area occupied or the geographical range changing? So in this case, if we look at pygmy shrew, for example, the pink triangles is where the species was recorded in that hectare in the last atlas period. The green circle is where it was there in the last atlas period and is there. And the upward triangle is, this is a new um, occupied hectare in the current atlas period. And the thing I wanted to draw attention, your attention to is what a large number of pink dots there are for this species here, which again is flagging it. The, the scale of that fall is not sufficient on the red list, unlike for changes for uh, red squirrel. But nevertheless, I think that's a cause for some concern as a um, comparison for red squirrel. Now, we have some issues with the way in which data are, are collected at the moment for most mammal species. One is that rare things go as much for a common pipistrelle as it does for a brown rat or a grey squirrel or a rabbit. And I think we really need to communicate better about how important it is that we get information on all of these species. Because otherwise the only way we can really get around that record problem is by, well, we, we're playing at the moment or using um, statistical techniques where we try and, and account for observer bias or over-recording of some species. Um, and the way that we're doing that is looking at how, if you have an occupied square and you've recorded other things in it at the same time, we're trying to use that as a, as a means of adjusting that if you'd done small mammal trapping, for example, and you, you bothered reporting you had a wood mouse, but you don't report that you have, um, I don't know, a bank full or a, or a common shrew, that's probably because they were there. Okay. Other than that, though, it's, it's really a hard problem to deal with. And I think we need a lot more information about survey effort and also to encourage people just to record poor, um, things they perceive to be common. We also don't have so many records of Lysler's bat, for example. And at the other, other end, we have people being very excited about recording some species. If you were to just look at the total number of records, you'd think we have more hedgehogs than any other mammal species in the UK, because people are very keen to tell, tell somebody about them. Likewise, people uh, are very keen to report observations of Beckstein's bat. They're also prone to something unusual about them. So the very large bat roost, for example, and much more um, are overrepresented. Now, I'm not suggesting that people stop reporting these things, but what I'm saying is you just need to bring the things to the same level. And again, one of the advantages of using something like the Mammal Mapper app, if you were out in the evening to talk, you saw a fox at the same time, you'd record it because you've got the app open there. And also we can make an inference because we know how long people have spent observing when you use the Mammal Mapper app because you press start at the start of your walk. We know that if you haven't recorded anything during that time, it's because the thing wasn't there. Okay, so it gives us a much more precise handle on our mammal data. We also, of course, have issues because cryptic things might be missed. So we've got things like the recent discovery of Alcathoe bat, um, which is very similar to the whiskered and brants bat. We've got grey and brown long-eared. And really, they were looking at genetic techniques to help us in that situation. So just to tell you a little bit more about the occupancy trends analysis. So if we adjust 
basically for survey effort, we can see that for Beckstein's bats, although the numbers of records in absolute terms have gone up, it looks like there's probably no change, at least on that metric. So this is if you've got a one kilometre square where you know that you've had the species in the past, we're looking year on year about whether that uh, whether there's an same or different probability of the species being found in subsequent years. Okay. Conversely, though, if we look at things like bank voles, and in fact, all of the small mammals with the, with the exception of wood mice and pygmy shrews, unfortunately, we didn't have enough data to populate the models with, but all the, all the non-wood uh, mouse species, all are lines over time. It's fair to say, just before I go on, that although they're all showing negative declines, it won't be sufficient to put any of these species on the red list. The one that we're looking at most clo closely are, are the stoats and the weasels, where the declines look to be very significant. For things like bank voles, to me this is worrying, and it's another reason why we shouldn't just take the red list as the be all and end all. But I think we need to be keeping an eye on bank voles, harvest mice, field voles, for example, because they're so important in our ecosystems and they're things where the long term trend, although it's a shallow, is a decline. Okay, so I'm just going to finish up by going through which species are on the red list. And the first one um, is the regionally extinct species, and we've got the wolf in that category, which is the first time really that there's been official recognition. The wolf is not the only species to have gone extinct in Britain since the last ice age and the reason only wolf is on the list and not lynx for example is that IUCN set a cutoff year of 1500. There has to be a reasonable probability that the species was present after 1500. Okay. Critically endangered, we've got the wildcat, and as you may well know, in Scotland now, it's thought that we're down to the last literally handfuls of uh, pure wildcat, and the situation became so bad, actually, that it looks like we're going to have to be thinking about captive breeding and release as, as the means of restoring that species, and there is a programme at the moment led by Edinburgh Zoo on that. We also have greater mouse eared bats, where there was only a single individual known uh, who actually hasn't been seen, he wasn't seen last year. We don't, we can't classify it as extinct though, because, uh, and the same with black rat, even though we know black rat has been exterminated from places like the Shants and Lundy, which was one of its last, uh, the last places it was hanging on. The reason that they're not declared extinct is to do that, you would have to have a systematic survey would actually demonstrate that the species was no longer present and that hasn't been done. So if anybody feels inspired to go on a hunt for <laughs> black rats, please do and let me know what you find. Endangered, we've got red squirrel, the water vole, the grey long ear bat, and also for the first time, and this actually um, was a change that occurred actually during the process of writing this red list. So if you get the um, uh, the previous document, the review of the uh, population status of British mammals, it won't show beaver as being endangered on the red list. Since then, there's been a bit of a change of heart because it's, it's been realised that actually there are free living populations and it's a bit silly really just to ignore the fact that they're there. It's endangered because although it seems to be doing rather well in the places where it has been introduced, the populations are still isolated and they're quite small in number and there's a plausible threat in that it could be that there could be a change in public mood and people could cull them. You know, it wouldn't be that hard at this point to get rid of beavers if you really didn't want them. Vulnerable, we've got hedgehog, serotine bat, dormouse, uh, orkney vole and barber style bat. And then the next category down is the next, the near threatened stuff, Lyslers, mountain hare. Um, I'll, I'll pause for a moment on mountain hare because uh, on the 22nd of March, we're going to be launching a new volunteer national mountain hare survey in Scotland, which is obviously not that far from Northumbria and you might want to go and take part in that. Again, it's going to be very largely based around using the mammal mapper 
app and what we're saying is basically if anybody is going walking uh, in the uplands please switch the mammal mapper on as you go and report what you find and the reason that we're doing this is we really have a very poor handle on the conservation status of mountain hare there's obviously been a lot of concern around uh, culling uh, on shooting estates in Scotland and we've got a fairly good idea of densities in those places um, and one of the issues is that the places where the culling happens has also been the places that have, we suspect have had the highest densities but we don't know that because we don't have data from everywhere else. Also on the near threatened list we've got harvest mouse and again we are working on starting a new national survey of harvest mice and again this is of interest in Northumbria because you're basically at the edge of the, the limit, uh, the geographical range for this species. There, there are historical records and it would be great to know what proportion of those are still occupied or whether we're seeing a decline. And of course, harvest mice are very amenable to, um, for, to get lots of people involved in because you can go on nest searches, which is quite a fun activity to do. Also on there, we've got um, the Nethusias pipistrel, and there, although we've got increasing numbers of records, they're still very scattered. And also recently, we've realised that this species is migrating from places as far away as Latvia. And one of the big concerns for this species is things like offshore wind development, because between Latvia and the UK, there's an awful lot of wind turbines, including many that we're putting in the, red, in the North Sea. And then the final one on that list is the silly shrew or the lesser white tooth shrew. Now, as I mentioned earlier, there's a few species where we just don't have enough data to say anything about them. We can't even really draw a sensible map of them. And these are the whiskered, and the alkathoe and the brant spats, which are quite difficult to tell apart in the hand and really rely on genetic ID. So if any of you are into your bats, it would be great just simply to have more presence absence data. Can you get your, um, your dropping samples genetically identified so we know what we've got? Also on there is wild boar, uh, a bit of mummy. Um, in fact, the Mammal Society's own view of that is that this species should be on the threatened list on, in the same way that the beaver is, because the populations are small and geographically isolated. Um, and there's a lot of political <laughs> background as to why they're currently classed as data deficient that I don't have time to go into now. Perhaps that's a talk for another day. Okay. So if you, to, if you went and looked at the Mammals 2018 report, um, which is this one, which actually gives you a update on each species. So if you click to water bowl, it's got nice maps and pictures, everything you might need to know in a handy format. One of the things it has is a table of all the species with the population sizes. And as I say, it gives intervals uh, or the plausible intervals for each of these species in a nice list. Okay, and you know, ranging everything from the hedgehog to the pygmy shrew. So, what next? What could you get involved in? Well, focus your research activities or your own data collection on species that are threatened or near threatened so particularly Nethusias pipistrel and harvest mice would be really useful also on the data deficient species so simply going out with nets for a couple of hours and seeing what you get in woodlands would be great and also think about projects on indicator species things like the shrews and the field voles and possibly otters do download and use the Mammal Mapper app. Please, if you have expertise in your local group, do keep going with Longworth Trapping um, so that we can get detailed data on our small mammal populations. It's a real concern that we might be losing that sort of expertise among the community, and we really do need that sort of information. Because obviously, with a Mammal Mapper, you're not going to be able to populate it with your small mammal data, really, unless you've actually gone out and set a trapping grid or a trapping transect. Okay, so thank you very much. I hope that's given you some food for thought and um, any questions, feel free to get in touch. 
Thanks a lot and happy mammal surveying.